This meeting is being recorded. All right. Hang on a second. I'll share my screen here. Okay, great. Well, I guess we'll be able to start soon. So uh, let's start this seminar. Welcome everyone to, uh, to the Sinter seminar. So we have two talks today. Uh, first one will be given by Dr. Chris Crawford, who is a physical scientist with the US Geological Survey. Uh, at the Earth Resources Observation and Science Center in Sioux Falls, South Dakota. And uh, Chris has been working with uh, US, USGS uh, Landsat uh, a lot. So he's a, he's a project scientist with, uh, with Landsat, uh, data acquisition manager, principal scientist for the US Geological Survey Sustainable Land Imaging Program for future Landsat missions. And uh, well, Chris has a very wide background of expertise in uh, in uh, applying applying these data for various purposes. So let's see. I'm getting Can a blank screen. That? I'm getting a blank screen, at least for me. Hmm. Chris, maybe try stop share and then sharing again. Make sure you're choosing okay. the right window there. Maybe uh, this will work. Can you see that? Looks yep. great. Okay, very good. Go ahead. Okay, hey, thanks for the introduction. Sorry for the run around here on the getting started. Um, it's good to be with this group. I hadn't been, um, I hadn't attended one of these seminars in a, in a while, um, but I thanks for the opportunity to speak and give an update on Landsat 9 and uh, what I think is uh, really a new era for Landsat uh, in terms of cryosphere mapping. So I'll give a little bit of a background on the, uh, just I like to st always start with talking about uh, the, the mission partnership uh, between NASA and USGS. I'll give an update on Landsat 9 and some of the commissioning activities, uh, the data acquisition, uh, and then talk a little bit about the data products and uh, a fractional snow cover uh, product that we're going to be releasing soon. And then I'll finish up talking about um, just a little uh, preview of where we are with the Landsat Next mission. So, you know, this is, I'm sure a lot of folks on here are familiar with Landsat. Um, you know, we've been operating uh, since 1972. Uh, you know, the, the mission goal really hasn't changed. Um, it's basically to provide earth-looking measurements um, to enable attribution and detection of natural versus anthropogenic changes in, in land surface. We've seen uh, a, a, an expansion uh, uh, and an acceleration of applications using Landsat data, particularly uh, in the aquatic area. So we are uh, considered, I think, more of a workhorse satellite mission these days. And so for pretty much two thirds of Landsat's lifetime, there've been two active satellites providing eight day temporal coverage. So we oftentimes kind of 16 days is what is uh, uh, commonly associated with Landsat, but we've actually, for, for the bulk of the record, have had eight day uh, temporal revisit. And I'll come back to that here in a minute with uh, Landsat eight and nine. So uh, in terms of the mission partnership, uh, NASA is largely responsible for the technology investments the mission requirements. Uh, they develop the space segment. This includes development, launch, checkout, and commissioning of the instruments. Uh, they handle the pre-launch calibration. They have their own science and applications program, uh, as well as communications and outreach. And so the USGS uh, is, is re largely responsible for the user needs, uh, the mission requirements as well, uh, the ground segment. So we develop the ground segment and we operate downlink, process, archive, manage, and distribute the data we conduct on-orbit operations and data acquisition. We handle the post-launch calibration. Uh, we generate the science data products, and we also have our own science uh, in uh, applications and communication and outreach uh, uh, program. And so what I've highlighted here in, in bold is where uh, the, 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 the agencies work very closely together, uh, but the, the, the bold is where there's a lot of overlap uh, in terms of uh, integration 
uh, of the teams. So uh, this is the, kind of the state of the Landsat Global Archive as of 2020. I need to go back up and, and re, re uh, uh, update this, but this just kind of goes to show sort of how, you know, over time Landsat has evolved to, to uh, be a global mission. And you can see certain areas uh, uh, across the globe uh, have, th there's a, a variation in the, the amount of data available uh, or the imaging coverage over time. Uh, but now with Landsat 8 and Landsat 9, we're, we're gonna be moving in, into more of a systematic global observation um, uh, a capability. And, and I'll come back to that here in a second. So um, Landsat 9 was launched from Vandenberg Space Force Base in California uh, on September 27th. Uh, the observatory carries uh, the multispectral V-Sphere operational land imager uh, and the dual channel thermal infrared sensor. Uh, this is oftentimes referred to as a clone or a rebuild of Landsat 8. Um, Landsat 9, it, this, so they're very comparable in terms of the observatories, but Landsat 9 do, does have a few additional uh, capabilities uh, uh, that, I'll, that really kind of result in uh, slightly better uh, radiometry uh, and uh, overall uh, better system uh, calibration. And so we're very excited uh, about uh, Landsat 9. The commissioning was completed uh, and we started operations uh, in late January. Uh, this image here on the right just shows uh, one of the first images we got on the first day of imaging on October 31st uh, over the Himalayas. And uh, we saw that and I was just like, wow, this is fantastic. Uh, and so we released the collection to Landsat Collection 2 uh, Landsat 9 science data uh, on February 10th. So you can now get Landsat 9 data um, basically in a pre-ops mode as well as uh, what we're, we're now sort of on our nominal uh, acquisition cadence. So some of the things I thought might be interesting uh, for the folks on the line here is that, you know, we went back and reprocessed the data. So you can actually get Landsat 9 data all the way back into early November. Um, it took us, you know, it, during the commissioning, which is this sort of 100-day period, um, uh, you know, we're still working out some things uh, on orbit, but there's still, I think we've acquired now over 60,000 uh, images, and now we're in full operation. So you can go back and get um, all the data um, even back into uh, this past November. One of the interesting things that uh, uh, we did was we underflew Landsat 8 with Landsat 9 uh, from November 12th to November 17th while Landsat 9 was on its ascent to its final orbit. And so we got five days there where we got overlapping coverage uh, between Landsat 8 and Landsat 9. And this is uh, really a, a unique data set. Um, November, maybe not the most ideal time for uh, a lot of science applications, but nevertheless, uh, it's a unique data set. And so I did want to just kind of highlight that, that if folks are interested, they can sort of look at in the archive. Uh, Landsat 9 has been calibrated, cross-calibrated to Landsat 8 using pseudo-variant calibration sites in the vSphere and uh, calibrated to coastal inland water uh, buoys for the thermal infrared. Um, the absolute calibra the absolute on onboard calibrations uh, between Landsat 8 and Landsat 9 agree to, to uh, less than 1%. So this is a, a really an exceptional achievement um, for both NASA uh, and the USGS, and we're very excited. And uh, folks can have a, a whole lot of confidence in the calibration of this data. So one of the things that's really interesting about Landsat um, is that with Landsat 8, we, we expanded our operational science data acquisition fairly significantly because Landsat 8 provided a, a lot of new capabilities. And so since it's a near polar orbiting mission, you know, we get a lot of data over uh, the Arctic or the circumpolar region, as well as over Antarctica. And we started acquiring a lot of this data back in 2015. And so there's building up a, a, re a relatively nice uh, imaging record um, in the polar regions um, and now that we have Landsat 8, we're now acquiring more data uh, than we've ever acquired before. And so um, in, in a lot of the uh, high, very low and high latitude regions, we're getting basically now one, one day revisit or two day revisit in some of the high latitude and low, low latitude regions. And I think this reflects a significant uh, advancement in the capability to use 
uh, both the multispectral vSphere and the thermal infrared data to, to understand uh, the changes that are ongoing uh, in, in the polar regions. And, and so this has become kind of an, an important emphasis uh, uh, for me uh, in terms of the data acquisition manager. And so we're, we're following this kind of closely. These are, are simulated orbital simulations. Um, and so they don't necessarily reflect mission planning or actually the day, daily acquisitions that we, we actually get because we have a, a limit as to how much we can acquire based on the, on the grounds uh, segment size. But you know, the, 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 really the message here is that we're acquiring a lot of data now. And if you're working in areas um, you know, uh, at high and low latitudes, which makes up predominantly a, a bulk of a cryosphere, this is a significant advancement in the data uh, availability and imaging. So Landsat Collection 2 data processing. So we reprocessed the full Landsat archive uh, back in late 2020. Uh, so, our, uh, so now we have, we're operating under Collection 2 and Landsat 9 data is only processed into Collection 2. We process the data actually on premises at Eros and then we sync it to the USGS virtual cloud. Uh, this graph on the, on the right hand side shows uh, Landsat 7, Landsat 8, uh, Landsat 9. We're actually um, in the process of now decommissioning Landsat 7. It's very low on fuel. Its orbit has been drifting for a number of years now. And so uh, we'll be lowering the orbit and it'll be um, reach, moving into a servicing orbit. NASA will be running a, an on-orbit servicing demonstration mission uh, in a couple of years. It'll be the first uh, uh, satellite to be an attempt to refuel uh, the satellite on orbit. So it should be kind of neat. And so Landsat 7 has been operating for 23 years. Um, I, I, I really love Landsat 7. It's been a great mission, um, but we're very excited now to replace uh, with Landsat 9. So we're, we're getting down our latency. Um, we had a few slight issues uh, with Landsat 8 in terms of the scene select mirror. And so we have to do some extra on-orbit uh, calibration dependencies, and that kind of drives a little bit of our product latency. Um, but at the end of the day, uh, you know, we're, we're now producing, able to produce, um, you know, level one calibrated data within four to six hours uh, off Landsat 8 and Landsat 9. And now, uh, you know, we're producing level two surface reflection, surface temperature products within 24 hours. So you can actually get these geophysical measurements now, at least from Landsat 9, uh, in about three days. So just to give you a rundown quickly on some of the, so we, we're producing global scene-based data products. Uh, uh, we produce a level one calibrated top of atmosphere digital count product um, that includes the solar and, uh, and uh, sensor view angles. And then we're producing uh, surface reflectance and surface temperature geophysical quantities um, uh, with also those, those angles and the metadata. Something we also do is we produce a, 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 what's called U.S. A, a Landsat Analysis Ready. This is a tile data product over CONUS, Alaska, and Hawaii. And this is basically a, a replicate of the same data that we produce at the scene level. But this, uh, this tile data uh, has, is, is uh, based on an equal, equal area projection. So you can do systematic continental analysis without having to deal uh, with the differences in, in geometry across UTM zones. This is where we're headed in the future in terms of providing seamless global data, um, but we're not quite there yet, but Landsat Analysis Ready data is our pathfinder. And if you are working uh, in the US, and I'm sorry this, I know this is an international group, uh, you know, this is the preferred data. Eventually we'll hopefully have a global uh, ARD. So you can get, we've changed our access since we processed, reprocessed Landsat Collection 2 in the cloud. Uh, we, we, um, we now um, uh, provide, uh, we still provide our legacy access through Earth Explorer with a bulk download option. We now provide a machine to machine uh, API for automated scripting. So we have users coming in and picking up data every day um, that comes down. And then if you want, if you're working in the AWS environment or you have an account there, then uh, the data is also available directly uh, in the USGS West Amazon uh, Web Services S3 bucket uh, to do basically direct access. So you don't have to download the data. So we're very excited about um, providing the data in multiple ways, both legacy and this sort of new way of doing business in the cloud. So I want to briefly talk ab about the fractional snow cover product that we've been working on. 
So we produced uh, the the we produced a, a product for Collection One starting uh, in 2017. It was just for the Western United States uh, at that time. Uh, but since that time, we've expanded uh, the Collection Two data to now uh, be uh, we're now going to be generating a fractional snow cover area for the full um, kind of continental United States. You know, basically the areas where we see you know have the possibility for for persistent snow cover. Uh, and then we're also doing this for Alaska as well. Now, there's a slight difference in that the Collection One product um, uh, used a, a, it accounted for the canopy, the forest canopy, and sort of applied an adjustment using some ancillary data. Uh, and so we have are continuing with that with Collection Two, but then we're also delivering the viewable snow, which is basically the apparent um, uh, you know, reflectivity uh, and snow uh, at at the at the sensor from from more or less the top of the canopy, and so we're so I guess what I'm trying to say is that we're going to be providing uh, this ground uh, canopy adjusted snow product for portions of the Western U.S., but for uh, other portions across the the U.S. and in Alaska, we're just pr um, producing the viewable snow. Uh, this will be available from uh, Landsat 4 through 8 um, uh, from 1982 to present. We'll, we'll be adding Landsat 9 down the road. Uh, it it's uses the snow covered uh, area and grain size uh, algorithm. Uh, it's a little bit different than, um, you know, the, the, the sort of research uh, or uh, algorithm um, um, that's, that's ran the SCAG algorithm. So we, we're sort of kind of placing ourselves as, as kind of the operational uh, product and there are some slight differences um, and um, that's important to know and that uh, we also process this data in the USGS virtual cloud and so it's also available for direct access uh, through the US Amazon WES uh, bucket. So we fully document the product. Uh, there's a data for format control book, the algorithm description documents there. We have a DOI for the data. We're planning to roll this data out sometime this month. Uh, and so, again, if you're only working in the U.S., this may be something that you want to look at using. Sorry for those in the international uh, area. We are working on a, starting to think about a, a, a global architecture uh, for such products, level three products, but uh, we're, we're just not there yet. This just shows a, a few examples um, of Landsat 9, and so we've basically uh, revised uh, or um, evolved the algorithm to be able to run on Landsat 9 data. And this just shows kind of uh, Landsat 9's really exceptional uh, uh, radiometry and then the retrieved uh, fractional snow cover uh, from Landsat 9 uh, using uh, the SCAG algorithm. We're very excited about this. And you can see sort of, you know, the, the importance of the canopy there uh, in, in uh, an area in Utah, uh, very dark. And so we're not getting uh, very much uh, viewable snow retrieved, uh, but nevertheless, uh, it's a uh, really important advancement, and I'm I'm excited to see how the 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 research and applications community take up Landsat 9 to uh, advance this data. I really like this example. You know, we this is just a, a low lower elevation area in eastern Colorado, but just shows you know even over some of the agricultural regions where we get these you know very quick hitting streak, uh, snowstorms that drop streaks of snow that we're picking up this signal very, very clearly. And uh, I think it's quite nice. So I wanted to finish up talking about um, kind of where we are and where we're headed into the future. So, uh, you know, in the, at least in the US, we take a lot of our uh, uh, guidance at the agency level from uh, the uh, earth science and applications uh, from space decadal survey. And I just, Kind of like to remind folks, uh, there was an important finding um, that the USGS uh, has transformed the Landsat program, um, you know, into a sustainable land imaging program. Uh, and so, you know, and it's done a good job of connecting the scientific and user communities and developers of new measurement technologies uh, and, and new products. And this really has put Landsat on a, on a fairly strong operational footing, and it's sort of viewed like that. And so uh, we're, we're, we're moving forward with Landsat under what we call the this SLI program, uh, which uh, in, can include a range uh, of different types of earth observations, not just Landsat, um, but we are, are very excited uh, about where Landsat uh, and SLI uh, is headed into the future. 
We've done, ex, uh, uh, the USGS has done extensive uh, user need and community input uh, on the next Landsat uh, uh, mission that we've uh, uh, canvassed the community. Um, and so I can say that both user needs from the terrestrial land and the aquatic remote sensing community at large is being represented uh, in the development of the science requirements for the mission. Uh, we've, we uh, have gathered user needs from federal agencies, uh, from the Landsat Advisory Group, Natural Resource Council, um, um, uh, the recommendations from our, our uh, Landsat science team. We've had a, a number of focused subject matter expert groups on some of the spectral advancements that we're expecting uh, for Landsat to support emerging applications. And then there's NASA has also released a, a number of uh, 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 requests for information uh, documents out um, uh, over the past year or so uh, on, on uh, reaching out to the community. So we tend to see the, the traditional Landsat applications, you know, are like things like land cover, forestry, vegetation, dynamics, uh, agriculture, evapotranspiration, fire, urbanization, ice and snow, and coastal freshwater. And so we're going to be able to continue to support uh, these application areas moving forward. But we also see these emerging uh, science needs and application needs coming from the community, particularly in the area of agriculture, forest monitoring, water, climate, and minerals. And so what we're really looking at doing is uh, in, in improving the spatial resolution for the next Landsat uh, mission, uh, improving the temporal revisit for to eight days or better for, for one single mission, and then adding uh, a number of new spectral bands uh, to basically support um, uh, the emerging science applications while maintaining continuity uh, with traditional Landsat applications. And you can kind of see here that uh, ice dynamics and snow hydrology are really viewed as kind of key uh, and uh, highly important uh, um, uh, application uh, emerging applications. And so uh, we're very excited about uh, this measurement capability that's coming. So just to finish, you know, Landsat Next advancements and the proposed, and again, I'd, I'd sort of highlight these are proposed science measurements um, because we're still uh, early in the process. But, uh, you know, we're looking to increase the spatial resolution of the V-SWEAR measurements um, from 10 to 20 to 60. Uh, we're going to be increasing the spatial resolution of the thermal infrared measurements to 60 meters. We're going to be looking to improve the temporal frequency to eight days or better for one Landsat. Uh, and then uh, the radiometric performance um, of this new kind of measurement concept uh, will definitely uh, match uh, the radiometric performance of Landsat and eight and Landsat nine at 30 meters. And so you can see here on the right, this, the spectral comparison, I, I sort of view the spectral uh, uh, advancements for Landsat Next to be kind of a, a significant leap forwards. Uh, and, and this just compares kind of what we're doing today with Landsat 9 and then what's on the table uh, for uh, consideration for the next Landsat mission. And so we're thinking about uh, a 26 band uh, system that uh, includes 21 bands uh, in the V-SWEAR and five bands uh, in the thermal infrared. And a lot of these uh, new bands are gonna support things um, in the v uh such as snow cover, uh, you know, liquid water absorption, uh, ice absorption, being able to kind of get a better handle on the grain size. And then we're going to be adding uh, measurements for water vapor and improved atmospheric correction, uh, uh, more measurements for uh, water, water quality and even aquatic. So what's happening for those who, who kind of work across the cryosphere aquatic uh, ocean biology domain. We're going to be uh, adding measurements to, to retrieve chlorophyll. And then, you know, and then with respect to the, the thermal infrared, we're going to be adding measurements um, to retrieve surface emiss emissivity uh, independently from temperature. Uh, and so this will provide some new uh, elements uh, that will be helpful also for uh, the cryospheric sciences. So I'll end it there to, for now and pass it over to Thomas. And I guess what we'll do is take questions uh, uh, at the exactly. end. Exactly. Right? Okay. Yeah, sounds thanks, great. Chris. Hey, yeah, yeah. Super, super interesting presentation. So, uh, I'm going to stop you have sharing questions. This. Yeah. You, well, you can keep your, keep your slides on if, uh, if someone has a specific question, but, uh, please in the audience, uh, if you have a question, please raise your hand in the, in the system. Okay. There's one, the first one. So Jack, go ahead. 
or is that uh, just clapping? I guess I was just <laughs> I was clapping. It was, a, it was a really interesting presentation. But I will say I'm I'm really excited to see the investment in the fractional snow covered area products, and I've been using them in rice research, and they've been working really well. So we appreciate you guys producing them at USG. Okay, yeah, that's great to hear. Yeah, we're very excited uh, about this, and uh, uh, we're always keen to hear the feedback um, because it's sort of evolving. But I, I'm very excited. Uh, I think this is going to support uh, new areas for continental analysis, at least uh, for this next iteration, and some of the, some of the things I'm gonna. So we appreciate that feedback. So, and let us know if we, you know, uh, if on the products or something we need to to look into. We're we're more than happy to do that. Yeah, I'll reach out if I have any further questions. Sure, sounds good. Thanks. All right. So, anyone else? Just raise your hand or, or just speak up since if you cannot find the way to raise your hand. Okay, I, I'd have one, one question about your uh, fractional snow cover area product. So, uh, I mean, you are doing this for the for the US area, obviously, at the moment, but uh, do you have a like a long-term plan? You mentioned that it's a, it's a possibility to extend this globally, but do you have any time frame in mind when this could be? <laughs> yeah, that's a great question. So, um, <clears throat> so uh, yeah, we are, uh, we're kind of incrementally uh, scaling this up. I think that, um, you know, there's been some really good techniques that have been developed for adjustment of the forest canopy. I still feel like there needs to be some more work research done in that area, um, but I'm still sort of confident in, in the, the quality of the viewable fractional snow cover. And so I guess, um, you know, right now in terms of where we are globally, we're kind of wrestling with uh, the, the sort of uh, concept around global data products because it's very expensive uh, actually to make to process and maintain uh, large data sets. And so we're, we're trying to think innovatively about how we can offer the capability to generate global data products, but figure out how to uh, make it cost effective. Uh, and, and so what I can say is one of the areas I think we are planning to move towards is more of a cloud-based deployment of more of an on-demand capability rather than just basically building standalone data sets, which is traditionally what we've done in remote sensing has, has basically processed all the data and it just sits on a disk somewhere. But that's really changing now with the cloud. And so um, we are working on, we do have the capability to generate products uh, outside of the U.S., uh, we just uh, have, are not releasing those products to the public. So anyway, okay. But I think there's a lot more advancements that, that can come here. So this is just should just be viewed as an incremental sort of step in that direction. Okay, great. Well, thanks again for your talk. Uh, yeah, thank uh, you for having me. Appreciate it. Okay, and Thomas is uh, sharing his screen already so uh so before i let thomas on the move so just to introduce him so thomas uh, is the founder and managing director of uh, nvo environmental and earth observation it which is a uh, austrian company founded in 2001 uh, nvo is uh, focused on working in the field of uh, snow and land ice monitoring and natural hazards using mainly SAR, but also optical satellite data and uh, implementation and operation of services using using these data. Uh, so NVO is uh, very well known in European circles. So if you talk snow and ice and remote sensing, it is very likely that uh, Thomas and uh, NVO are somewhere behind the corner. So, uh, but without further ado, I let uh, Thomas give his presentation. Go ahead. Uh, yes, uh, thank you, Johan, uh, for this introduction. In my talk, uh, I will talk about recent experimental studies on uh, snow water equivalent retrieval in mountains by means of INSAR. And actually, when I was asked by Chris uh, to give this presentation, he mentioned uh, that I should also go on uh, new uh, upcoming systems in Europe. And uh, therefore, uh, oops. Uh, I will talk in my uh, presentation 
also a little bit on an upcoming Copernicus Roselle mission, uh, which will come in a couple of years. But I will focus primarily on uh, recent uh, field campaigns uh, carried out in uh, two places in uh, close to Innsbruck and one close at the Austrian Swiss border uh, in preparation of uh, this uh, mission. Now, what is Roselle? Roselle is the Alp and Saar mission for Copernicus, and it's uh, actually, as all the Copernicus missions, a uh, mission to support the European uh, services for monitoring natural hazards, land surfaces, sea ice, and land cryosphere. Currently, the mission is uh, prepared by the mission advisory group from the scientific point, and just the industrial contract has been signed. The launch of uh, this Alban SAR system will be in mid of uh, 2027, uh, and uh, it should be operational about uh, six months later. It will consist of two uh, satellites, very similar to Sentinel-1, A and B, and they will fly also in the same uh, orbital plane. And uh, the incidence angle range will be between 20 to 47 degrees. Swarthwith uh, will be about 260 kilometers, so very, very similar as Sentinel-1 in dual boat mode, and, uh, but it also is capable in operating in quad pole mode. The resolution is slightly better than in uh, 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 Sentinel-1. It is five times 10 meters in range and azimuth um, for the dual pole mode, and the noise equivalent sigma zero is below uh, 20, minus 28 dB. Uh, Actually, it is not uh, decided yet uh, the acquisition mode uh, of uh, Roselle, if it will be Scansar or TOPS mode, uh, but and this is still in discussion. And uh, probably it will, it will be a kind of uh, Scansar uh, uh, mode where, where this is operating. Roselle is not seen as alone. Uh, alone. It will be, of course, uh, together uh, operating with Sentinel-1. And uh, there are two constellations uh, currently in discussion. So one constellation is uh, to have four satellites, so two times rows L, A and B, and uh, C and D of Sentinel-1. And this uh, is shifted by three days, so to have a maximum of uh, the coverage, so a very high observation frequency. The repeat uh, uh, orbit would be uh, every three days, although not by the same frequency. So it's L band, C band uh, alternating at three days. And uh, this is, of course, uh, driven primarily by uh, services of sea ice and uh, marine services. And then the other option is a kind of tandem constellation. And uh, Roselle uh, would follow here Sentinel-1 within a few minutes. So this would mean that we would have a kind of quasi multi-frequency SAR. So L-band and C-band at a co and cross polarization acquired uh, within uh, a few minutes. But uh, of course, uh, there are some technical issues like earth rotation uh, speed will change depending on the latitude. And this has an impact on the distance between Roselle and Sentinel-1. And then, of course, uh, we have also to download the data to the receiving stations. And if both satellites are passing by to the few uh, receiving stations, that could be also uh, a kind of uh, limitation because it's not only Roselle and Sentinel-1. There are many other Sentinels uh, uh, actually operating. But there is also uh, another uh, a synergy with other Sentinels. And I want to mention here uh, the combination of the L-band uh, active system together with SIMA, which is uh, also from Copernicus 2, from this convention, uh, expansion missions, a passive microwave uh, instrument. And both together would, of course, be very interesting for snow monitoring. Uh, where the passive microwave uh, would take over uh, the, the coarser resolution, uh, the gentle terrain, and Roselle uh, could uh, look for the monitoring of the mountain regions uh, with a higher resolution. Now, uh, what are the highest uh, priority for the cryosphere? Uh, the parameters of uh, the has the aim to fill the gaps and also to provide unique information. And uh, this has been separated for floating ice, glaciers, ice caps, and ice sheets. You see here in red, those parameters were of high priority and where the Alpine uh, can uh, contribute significantly and improve the 
products and the services. And for snow, actually, there is one parameter mentioned, which is snow water equivalent, especially in mountain regions. And uh, this was identified by the uh, polar expert group, which has uh, published three reports on the requirements uh, on the uh, different parameters in the different regions, like here, the here is the price and um, the next main operation is a uh, retrieve of L-band. There are a couple of uh, experiments already running in the frame of ESA projects, uh, but also in the frame of uh, other activities. And here I want to show actually the status of these ongoing activities. Now, very quickly on the basis, uh, what is the plan to retrieve uh, for uh, the snow water equivalent? Uh, in mountainous regions is uh, the interferometric approach. Uh, I think this is quite well known. Uh, here uh, we see that the interferometric phase has various uh, components like uh, the flat uh, terrain, uh, flat earth contribution, the topographic contribution, atmospheric, and also probably ionospheric uh, contributions, which have to be uh, accounted in the equation. But what we are interested in is uh, actually the retrieval of the phase shift uh, due to snow water equivalent. This is, of uh, this is, of course, only suitable for uh, dry snow, as in wet snow. Uh, the uh, radar has uh, only a very small uh, penetration and is limited to the surface. And we have a direct relation between the snow water equivalent uh, and uh, the, uh, the interferometric phase. And uh, what we are measuring is not the absolute uh, snow water equivalent, I have to say, but only the accumulated uh, snow mass uh, in the time period between the two image acquisition. And this shows you actually the equations when we are counting for the local slopes, uh, in, which is needed in mountainous regions. Now, uh, just to give you an idea, we can do some simulations and just that you know uh, how sensitive this method is. Uh, so at Elband, for example, one phase cycle of uh, snow water equivalent, uh, uh, one phase cycle of uh, uh, the uh, at Elband or C-band corresponds uh, to 131 or 29 uh, millimeters uh, of uh, uh, snow water equivalent at 30 degrees uh, incidence angle for flat terrain. And when we look, for example, for fresh snow with a density of 150 kilogram per cubic meter, then it's about 80 centimeters of fresh snow accumulation or 20 centimeters of fresh snow accumulation. The higher the density is, of course, uh, then uh, we have, of course, this is reduced because we are going for the density. There is also a slight uh, dependence on the density in the retrieval, but this is only uh, the case for uh, higher incidence angle above 50 degrees. Be below 50 degrees incidence angle, uh, we can uh, use uh, a density independent uh, equation. But in mountain regions, uh, we know that we have often uh, incidence angles above the 50 degrees, of the, especially in the back slopes. So therefore, we have to go with the uh, full equation. And um, currently, uh, there were a couple of experiments or tests uh, made out, and a few uh, examples have been shown uh, where we were able to retrieve snow water equivalent from the Alpine, and uh, different groups have applied this. And um, uh, but of course, in mountain regions, this is of course uh, due to this. Uh, hard topography, quite difficult. And therefore, in preparation of uh, the Roselle mission, but also of another SAR mission, uh, we uh, made an airborne SAR campaign in cooperation with uh, DLR and funded by ESA. It is called the ESA SAR SIM uh, hydro terror com campaign. And uh, this is the test area Burgetal, which is a high alpine test area uh, very close to Innsbruck, about 25 kilometers southwest to it. It has uh, uh, relatively uh, high terrain at 2,000 to 2,500 meters, and we have uh, three main plateaus uh, and uh, uh, at about 2,000 meters in the lower part. 
then one uh, flat region here uh, at about 2,200 meters, and the upper part, which is actually here in these regions at about 2,350 to uh, 2,400 meters. We were acquiring this, uh, 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 this test area at C and L band at very high resolution, as usual with airborne campaigns, uh, uh, with a resolution below uh, uh, one meter and the pixel size of 20 centimeters uh, to 30 centimeters in range at Azimut uh, at C band and 40 centimeters and 60 centimeters at L band. Uh, and uh, these are the data what we actually got from uh, the from DLR. Now there were uh, various uh, flights uh, uh, where we were uh, in March 21, so last year. So at the beginning of uh, uh, March, there we were setting up the corner reflectors, and then we had overall uh, eight to nine flight uh, days. And every flight they were, were, were requiring ascending and descending passes a couple of times. And uh, so we were also capable uh, to stack uh, the different uh, data sets in order to reduce the face noise. And we were quite lucky because on two of the dates, uh, we got also fresh snowfall. Uh, and uh, especially from the third to the sixth, there was fresh snowfall of about 10 centimeters, quite uniformly distributed over the uh, area and uh, from the 13th to the 19th of uh, March there was 30 centimeters snowfall in the lower regions and in the higher part so at the 2300 meters elevation there was about 50 meters so we had an increased slope in the uh, snow accumulation. Now what were the field activities what we carried out uh, so uh, at all of the overpasses uh, and data acquisitions we were in the field. So we made snow transects along uh, the blue lines. It's just a view of the valley outside. And uh, uh, the primary view here would be uh, the, uh, the average uh, or the, the plain fields in the uh, center of the test area at about 2,200 meters elevation. We were, we were carrying up uh, corner reflectors, which were used as reference points. Uh, and you see the locations here. They were fixed mounted on, on rocks, which uh, were sticking out of the snow in order to have them really stable over this one month period. And during all the overflights, uh, we did snow transects uh, to get the feeling uh, and measurements about the snow accumulation. And then, of course, we did also uh, snow pits with detailed uh, information on uh, density profiles, temperature, and uh, also hardness, uh, and all the stratigraphy. Oops. Um, now, this is one example of uh, the C-band. Um, we see here the test area, the main test area. Very nicely, you see uh, also the trees in the forepart, but the main test regions is shown here. This part at C-band. We have some ghost uh, parts here in the uh, slopes. Uh, the corner reflectors are very nicely visible here, uh, what is shown here, and they are visible in the amplitude, but also in the face images. And this is, this is one example of the corresponding uh, uh, L-band image, uh, also showing some differences, of course, to the C-band, because we have a much deeper penetration in this uh, high L-band tumbler region below uh, these surfaces. Now, when we apply the algorithm, uh, I just quickly want to show you the very preliminary results of this analysis. We see on the left side the snow water equivalent uh, derived for the period when we have a small uh, snowfall of about uh, this 10 centimeters. And um, the mean in situ V values uh, uh, measured uh, along the transects were about uh, 14 millimeters and uh, at the same point we took out of the image uh, the measured uh, or derived inside retrieval of snowboard equivalence is about 16. And for the L band, of course, the resolution is slightly lower. And uh, we see also quite a good agreement with the slightly higher root mean square difference. What, of course, is also visible that we have uh, severe distortions uh, on the four slopes where actually that we cannot get any uh, uh, suitable um, snow water equivalent uh, information out. So this is in general in the final product marked out. Now I want to just introduce the second campaign uh, in the Engadin area where we wanted to apply this concept also in uh, 
for alpine uh, in high alpine terrain using other pulsar data. This shows you just the area. It is also at about uh, uh, 1700 uh, meters in this valley, Engadin Valley, between Sil, St. Moritz, and Cernes, and goes up to about 4000 meters at the Pitz Banina. Our field measurements were focusing on the valley floor with cultivated uh, meadows. And uh, during the pulsar acquisitions, which were actually every two weeks, uh, in a few cases in general, it was uh, 28 days, which is quite long uh, for alpine uh, snowpack. Uh, we carried out uh, the field campaigns uh, and the snow measurements were carried out in these places. We were looking uh, at the first hand on the coherence uh, and uh, the fringes at the uh, C-band uh, with six days interferogram. And what we see is that we have stable snow conditions without any snow, as is shown here in the case one, uh, case A, the coherence and the fringes is preserved. When we have, uh, uh, as we show here, uh, the significant snowfall as a case B, then it's in general a decorrelation observed in most of the places. So it's very hard at C-band to get any information out, if not possible. And if there's a small snow cover or no uh, snowfall, then of course we have some coherence. That's the case C. Then uh, this is for one case in uh, uh, January with two days uh, difference where there was some snowfall uh, in the places. At L-band, we can get some uh, uh, coherence and the fringes are nicely shown. We can subtract uh, the topography using a digital elevation model and uh, we can preserve the fringes, but still there are some issues if you look in detail, but I can't go in detail now. But when we apply the retrieval method, we get a kind of pattern which can be explained, uh, uh, which we validated with in situ measurements and uh, the same pattern is found. But there is of course also some sources of visible areas, uh, which is uh, primarily caused by remaining topography, by forests, which is not really uh, possible to uh, get their information out of it, and also maybe atmospheric uh, uh, influence, which is not being corrected in this product. And also, uh, we found uh, larger errors towards low and high uh, insert V values which is probably caused by face unwrapping issues because we are covering quite a uh, large area in this case and the high uh, elevation difference between 1700 to 4000 meters where we have different accumulation rates. And now I come to the conclusions. Uh, so we have with this repeat bus interferometry, a direct physical based method for retrieving snow water equivalent for dry snowback. And, um, but it is uh, quite a tricky method to apply in mountainous regions as uh, the preliminary analysis of the campaign data show. So C-band can be used in slight snow accumulation, but uh, shows in general decorrelation with increasing amount of snow. And uh, L-band is much more robust, but of course also less sensitive. And it's useful in general uh, for higher snow accumulation. We recommend in this case, that's our experience now to use the L-band in combination with the C-band, but in general, the L-band alone is sufficient. For uh, snow water equivalent in mountain regions, we need uh, available reference points. Uh, we used for the airborne campaign, the corner reflectors, which were cleaned of snow and uh, we know the face quite well. But for every phase plane, uh, in general, one reference point is needed and especially in mountain regions, uh, this is not always available and here some strategy uh, is needed. Uh, we are testing currently an approach where combining the insert together with uh, uh, snowpack models in order to uh, connect uh, the different uh, isolated phase planes uh, to the overall uh, part. Then foreshortening regions uh, show increased noise and in general poor ground resolution and are masked out. Uh, in general, uh, we can use ascending and descending passes uh, to uh, get a more complete uh, uh, figure of the snowboard equivalent. But of course, this is not always acquired on the same day. Uh, and here we have a kind of accumulation uh, then in dependence on the acquisition day. Forested areas uh, are the alpine in general coherence for uh, not very dense forests is preserved, 
but in general, what we found is that this V signal is masked uh, by the return from the tree stems. And uh, here we need some further detailed studies or to mask out forests or especially dense forests need to be masked out. And um, then we have one space uh, for a demonstration. We just found uh, one pair uh, in the Engadin region which was usable to uh, develop a concept. But here I have to say that uh, we have a 14 days interval and uh, there can a lot of melting uh, and other issues happen in this time period. So we think that the time period is quite long. Uh, we would prefer to have a shorter time period. and. Uh, as it is provided by Rose L with six days when we have two satellites. And this could be tested with SARCOM AB data, which uh, provides eight days repeat. So A and B uh, are available over the Alps and for many other places too. And this would offer now a great capability for testing this repeat, uh, uh, this V retrieval also in preparation of Rose L. Okay, thank you. Great, thank you, Thomas comprehensive presentation. So any questions or comments, please raise your hand or if you find that too difficult, then you can just shout out. Okay, HP. Great presentation, Tommy, that was wonderful. Um, I was wondering if you could comment on uh, any atmospheric corrections that you did at the C-band and whether you used a uh, like a cutoff for below some coherence where you, you didn't try to apply the retrieval algorithm? Yes, so the, the C-band uh, is quite tricky for the atmospheric correction, but there is actually a new auxiliary data product provided uh, and developed. It's the ETAT product. It, it's a kind of enhanced timing product, which was developed by uh, DLR in, on the contract of ESA, I think. And it will become operational for Sentinel-1 data. The ETAT mm -hmm. product takes ECMWF atmospheric data, then ionospheric uh, data sets, and uh, also the uh, solid earth tides and all this information. And for every part of these different uh, 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 reasons, you get uh, a timing correction. Hmm. And this timing correction can be applied on a pixel by pixel basis uh, uh, to the data sets. And we evaluated this uh, with, uh, uh, in Greenland uh, and Iceland. And it was also evaluated for interferometry by another group. And uh, we think that this is a quite uh, excellent product in order to get rid of this, uh, this uh, part. So uh, it is not operational yet. But there has been a paper published, I think, in IEEE. Uh, it's just coming out or came out uh, where we contributed to this. Great, thank you. Okay, thanks. Uh, Jeff has his hand up, but there's also a question from Ed in the chat. So I can read the question from Ed. Uh, so how, how important is the knowledge of the incidence angle at the air-snow interface? So not the snow ground, but the air-snow interface. Yeah, uh, snow air interface. Yeah, so in principle, the incidence and so uh, the incidence angle uh, is not that critical, so that we need to know it with the degree uh, accuracy. And uh, in general, when we have a digital elevation model, uh, we can calculate this quite accurately. Uh, so it's uh, sufficient accurate in principle. What I have also to say, uh, what is also our experience when we look to the time series, the method is in general much easier to apply when there is already some snow on the ground. So the accumulation on some snow on the ground is easier than to start from the very beginning. And this has something to do uh, with uh, the correlation or subpixel correlation, because we have a kind in, in alpine terrain, we have a kind of uh, subpixel surface roughness. And the snow has the trend to smooth out this, uh, uh, this surface roughness. So in principle, when we have uh, whatever, 20 centimeters, 30 centimeters of snow, then we have a really smooth uh, snowback, although below the ground is already uh, quite rough. This would mean on a sub-pixel scale that we have not a unique uh, 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 snow depth added or snow accumulation. So locally within the pixel. 
And that's, of course, uh, also causing some decorrelation. And uh, so what's our experience is that uh, when we start, for example, in the early winter, when there is already a little bit of snow with the smooth surface, as we see it here, for example, in this image, uh, then uh, uh, it is much easier to apply. And also the snow accumulation is much more uh, uh, uniform within one pixel. OK, great. Thanks. So Jeff, go ahead. Um, yeah, I had a similar question. That is, uh, the for the really was what is the source of the DEM that you're using, and and the second is if we look at the accuracy measurements from the various global DEM products that are available, you know the the accuracy of the elevation is something like eight meters in tandem X, and and the question then is, is what's the error when you're looking at the difference between two elevations, which is what you need to calculate the slope and, and then the, the incidence angle. And if, you, if the errors are not correlated, then the, the variance in the difference is simply the sum of the two variances. So if you have, if your RMS error in the DEM is, is say eight meters, your RMS error of the difference between two elevations is 11 meters. And oh. it seems like the, the available DEMs are, uh, you know, they're much coarser than the uh, resolution of your, of your data from the airborne missions, particularly. So yeah, for question sort of following up from Ed is, is yeah, what sensitivity to the errors in, in the uh, incidence angle? Yeah, so the, the, the incidence angle is not that close as I mentioned before. For the airborne campaign, we had a, a, a LIDAR DM, uh, so, so laser measurements with, uh, I think uh, it was half a meter resolution or whatever at least, uh, but we averaged it actually to uh, one meter or two meters resolution, uh, which was used finally for geocoding. But we have to say that the analysis actually is done all in, uh, so we are doing the analysis in, in SLC geometry, so in slant range geometry, and are transferring also the incidence angle in this uh, geometry. The major issue, I think, for me is not uh, the incidence angle, because that's uh, always a kind of general shift. But the more proper or, or the more critical issue is uh, are two. One is, of course, what is doing the ground below the snow. So if it is uh, because uh, it also depends if we have a thicker snowpack, we have a thermal insulation of the ground that the ground can change. And this has, of course, also an impact on the face. And the other issue is then, of course, uh, what HB mentioned is the atmosphere. Because the atmosphere can, of course, also add some, uh, we know this, that it has an impact on the face. And uh, this is, of course, also uh, a kind of gradient on a larger scale, of course, what uh, can be introduced in this product. This can be, of course, somehow reduced if you are using uh, uh, kind of reference points that can be roads, for example, when we know that uh, they are snow free and coherent and uh, that can be used. But of course, atmosphere can cause some tilts in these images and uh, you can just overcome this with the reference points in, in, in this way. So Great. as I mentioned, it, it's not an easy method to apply in mountain regions, but uh, uh, in general, we think for uh, towards uh, a kind of more operational or pre-operational processing, the combination with the snowpack models, so distributed snowpack models, which are available at 100 meters resolution for the Alps, for example, that would make sense. Okay, thanks. I think we are uh, out of time already, uh, but... Uh... Thanks to everyone for listening in. Thanks especially to Thomas and Chris for, for their talks. And uh, stay tuned for the next Sinter seminar. Okay, thanks to everyone.
Yeah, as you see, Thomas, these are strictly policed uh, North American meetings where when we run out of time, we quit. It's not like in Europe <laughs> <laughs> where, where we can just keep talking. <laughs> yeah, yeah, OK, no, no. Uh, yeah. <laughs> yeah, but those, uh, I don't know, if this is, I hope this is not going to stop immediately, but uh, yeah, great, uh, great results there. So, so. Uh, yeah, yeah, so it, uh, we are going on with it. Did you have, by the way, some, um, uh, did you go on with the analysis in Sudankele or these regions because you got actually also some of the Pulsar data there? Yeah, yeah, we are still looking at that. So, so I hope we can get the results out soon. So I guess, I guess you're a little bit a step further in those. We had some problems with the, with the identification of coherence and, uh, but, mm -hmm. but maybe I'll, uh, I'll let Jorge contact you about those. So. Yeah. No, we are actually not so convinced about Pulsar anymore. The data are excellent, but to get the data is a problem. And uh, we were so often in the field and uh, they were not acquired and provided. Yeah. So what we are now behind are SAOCOM data because they have eight days repeat. The data itself are excellent. So we already processed some of those, but, and, and that's a big uh, issue. They have an orbital tube of three kilometers. Mm. So you have so strong. Uh, uh, so if, if you plan to do something with this data, so we we are just two days ago, I was in contact with uh, uh, is this still recorded or? I can stop the recording. Yeah. Give me one second. It's really uh, 